Hello again, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. After last week's program, which was the most downloaded episode ever, lots of people listened, not everybody heard it. We're going to have another fun program today where we talk about all kinds of things, including a road report from Milwaukee, some of the MLW action, what I'm going to be doing over the next number of weeks, and a special deep dive, an omnibus even, for those of you who like that kind of thing, on why Joey Ryan is an insufferable douchebag. We're going to have some fun today, folks, and joining me to do this, he is the furthest thing from insufferable. He is Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, the post office playboy, but Susie has forsaken him, the proprietor of the French Toast Chateau, your friend and the idol of millions, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here for another insufferable episode of the Jim Cornette Experience here this week. And I feel like you put douchebags down by incorporating Joey Ryan with douchebags. Well, and you know, we're going to be hearing from the douchebag lobby, I'm sure. <laughs> because the the anti-douchebag defamation league, Adel, the addled people, <laughs> will be, um, you know, you said it. You said it last week on a program because we are going to say unkind but true things about all elite wrestling and the darlings and the idols of millions that people are going to lose their ever-loving shit. And shit was lost over the past week. And we will <laughs> we will talk about that. And speaking of being lo- of lo- shit being lost, you know what's happened just a few days ago. You don't? I- I'm not sure where you're going. James on Jeopardy. Oh, this guy again. Yeah. The fu- no, the fucking, he lost. He lost the freak of nature, this fucking genius, this, this uh, m- m- mental savant of whatever description had won over two and a half. He was closing in on $3 million, blowing everybody away. He loses to this, just this timid, milk toast young lady, just this meek, mild little, I don't, it was like, it was almost like to me, he didn't, he had job face on that episode. It was almost like to me that he, that somebody had said, Hey James, you know, uh, you, you, you want enough money there, pal. You know, you, you're hoiting the budget. <laughs> maybe Herb, Herb Stemple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe they told James, Hey, we need to, you know, how can we miss you? If you won't go away, you're already going to be coming back for the fucking, what is it, the Masters Tournament or whatever they call it? But um, anyway, and, and, and just a very uh, mild and meek young lady and boom and somehow, but he didn't he didn't seem on through the whole program. But I think it was Monday, I think he lost. I was so pissed because now I took it off the DVR. I was series recording. I understand the network promised him a spot on Tic Tac Doe to make up for it. Uh, well, only if Chuck Woolery <laughs> will uh, agree to, to come back and host it because they, they both had that overbite. <clears throat> James and uh, and Chuck. Anyway, um, but here was something that was won instead of lost over the last week. For those of you who are, have been paying attention over the last number of weeks to the program, we've been talking about the Crusade for Children. The telethon was this past week. The Crusade total this year, $5,690,000 to the uh, special needs kids of Kentucky and Southern Indiana from the WHS Crusade for Children. And we will have our totals uh, next week from the shirts that remember the hate is a hell of a motivator shirts, those brand new mm, shiny, just beautiful shirts, $5 from each one to crusade and the midnight express pictures at Jim the autograph reunion pictures, $5 to the American cancer society. Since those have been on sale of <laughs> what was it? The week I went to Richmond, I put those on sale and I've been on the road ever since practically or taking Harley to the vet. But uh, we will have those totals uh, when I issue those end of the month checks and we'll have those uh, next week on the program. Of course, they obviously accept donations at the crusade all year round at WHAS crusade.org, but we'll give our, our Cornets collectibles, a cult of Cornet totals next week. Hold on, I've got so much going on, I can't keep track. I need to hire, uh, do you know any good uh, uh, secretary, I mean secretaries? <laughs> <laughs> you bring up Harley Quinn, I guess briefly let's mention here, because I said it during the intro, uh, there was no drive through this week, instead we put up 
A little bonus, a five-hour-plus deep dive omnibus into OVW, but we mentioned on there that you were traveling, Harley Quinn was sick, and also there were some plumbing issues at the castle. Oh, what's, well, yes. What's going on yes. with Harley Quinn right now? Uh, Harley's feeling better. She got antibiotics. She had the upset tummy that we talked about, and then she went right into an allergy attack where she got a little cough, a little hack. And uh, she gets the allergies around here in the Ohio Valley. Everybody, she seems like she gets what daddy gets. I get an upset stomach. She gets an upset stomach. I got the hack and the allergies and the drip and the phlegm, and she gets the hack and the drip. But anyway, but she's uh, her medicine costs more than mine. And that's hard to do sometimes. But anyway, Harley's doing well. Uh, the plumbers dug the grease trap out of the uh, uh, front yard and filled everything in. Uh, now, next week, they're coming to replace the air conditioning that finally died after 15 years in my office here. So I'm getting that brand new three ton 60,000 BTU Mac daddy of I'm going to be able to hang meat up here. I'm going to be I'm going to be literally sitting here in a parka and a and a fucking of uh, 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 windbreaker. I guess a, a windbreaker wouldn't be really be, be that heavy. I'll have a parka come and I'm trying to think of what those hats are. Those hats. They got well. They, you got the parka around you, and you got the fucking igloo hat thing on. The fucking stocking cap. The skiing apparatus. Dunce cap. I don't know all these technical terms. Hey, watch. Was that a shot? <laughs> um, <laughs> we want to say good luck to our friend here, of a, a, a fine friend of the program and the cult cornet, Chael Sonnen, who is fighting Lioto Machida. On June 14th for Bellator, and th there is an interesting trivia fact connecting me and Chael, besides the fact that, that Chael and I are admirers of each other's work and, and we have fun conversations from time to time, there's something that's connecting me and Chael, and I did not know about it. I'm not a superstitious person, but this was just brought to my attention, that every time that I wish him good luck on this program before he fights, he wins. But the one time that I did not do it, that the fight was not brought to my attention and I somehow overlooked it and I did not do that, he lost. So it's I'm starting to be like his fucking lucky underwear. Maybe I should rephrase that. I'm a good luck charm <laughs> for Chael Sonnen. The, uh, the, he can't be the mouth of the South. He's, he's the, uh, the mouth of the Northwest. That doesn't rhyme. We'll work on that tagline. But uh, it, the the best promo in in MMA. Uh, good luck, Chael. And so, kick his ass. You're going down, Machida, baby. You're going down. It will never be over until the fight is over. Then it will be over. But but Chael will win. All right. We'll we'll just see about it. Which fight did he lose? Was that the Fedor match? I, I whichever the last one was that he lost. I don't know what to tell you. I've just somehow I've I've become connected to him in a spiritual way. My well wishes propel him on to victory. All right. Well, good luck. I wish that I could have my well wishes and anything else that I could have done could have propelled me to Milwaukee faster this past Friday. That I, I, I'll give you the MLW report here in a minute, folks. But everybody, we always talk about the road trip, right? And once again, now Milwaukee is not that far away. It is literally 395 miles from my house to the, to the hotel that we are staying at. Right. <clears throat> and so, and, and I've got to do live radio in studio to promote this fine event Friday afternoon at four 30. So I'll leave early on Friday morning and to, to have two extra hours of leeway between the time that I will arrive in Milwaukee and the time that, that I need to, to be at the radio station. Right. We got this all set up. At 12.30 in the afternoon, I was only 140 miles away from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right? At 4 o'clock, I was 75 miles away <laughs> from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Chicago, I love my fans in Chicago, but whoever laid out the Chicago interstate system, the road system, and whoever taught the people there how to drive – and the fact there's so many of them, you can all fuck off. It was chaos and a nightmare from Gary, Indiana, all the way through to the north side of Chicago, at which point then I'm hitting 5 o'clock traffic just anywhere. And it, so I did the, the, the radio spot by phone from a, a vacant church parking lot. I fear when I pulled in, lightning might strike. But 
<clears throat> I was able to salvage that spot. But yeah, it took nine hours and 45 minutes instead of six hours and 45 minutes to go to, to Milwaukee. But there's a few good things that I learned about Milwaukee. And one of them is if you are lucky enough to be near the Milwaukee airport, there's a place you got to go named Beer Bellies. It's a li- it doesn't look like much on the outside now. It's not a giant brand new gleaming place, but Beer Bellies was right next to the hotel we were at. And it's a bar and it's a restaurant, but it's not just like, you know, hey, let's come in and get drunk and eat some garbage food. The food is fucking excellent. The burgers are incredible. They do Friday fish fries, fresh fish fries of a number of fl- freshly floundered fish. <laughs> Uh, they, the Reuben rolls, they made a Reuben roll up and then deep fried it. And then they give you with the side of thousand Island, a dip. Oh my God. The wings had the crisp to them. The incredible web beer bellies. Jeez. How much did you eat? You got to go there and eat. Well, no, I'm looking around. I had the roll ups and I had the burger. The guy next to me had the wings and I'm looking at his wings. And I asked the woman, here's the only bad thing. I said, how late are y'all open tomorrow night? Which would have been the night after the show, right? We're coming back from from the beautiful Waukesha County Expo Center. And she's, oh, we're open till two or something. I think she said, but I, oh, excellent. She said, oh, but the kitchen now. What? The kitchen closes at 10. I'm like, Newman. Ah. So, but I got there Friday night in time to have beer bellies, right? So I encourage everybody. And then it was the normal weekend of binging and starving. Binge, not binging and purging, but binging and then starving. Um, I go sleep Friday night. Saturday morning, we get up. We're doing the production meeting for the live. Not only was it a television taping, but we were live one hour on Fury Road on Saturday night. So we're doing this production meeting at 930 in, in the morning. And all of a sudden, outside the window, we hear this torrential downpour start and the crackling of the thunder. And it just turned black and this heavy downpour and the thunder, thunder, thunder. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. And then it stops raining. And moments after that, we hear this sound like somebody's just throwing balls at the wall, right? And and, and at the uh, window. And we look outside and it's hail the size of mothballs, but millions of them. I've never seen shit come down. like, <laughs> And I'm like, oh, shit, black beauties in the parking lot, right? But it wasn't heavy enough to cause that. But it was just a deluge, a hailstorm, right? And I'm starting to have beware of dog flashbacks. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because it was the same thing. We were a live show in a building we had never run before, Florence, South Carolina Civic Center. Uh, you know, a lot of shit that needed to be done and this horrible weather moves in. Then we find out uh, Alexander Hammerstone has had plane issues come from the West Coast. He was at the airport at, you know, fucking four o'clock in the morning or whatever. And he won't get in until apparently uh, the same time as the live special that he's supposed to be wrestling on goes on the air live. <laughs> And then some other people's travel was flummoxed and then this and that. And we get to the arena and of of course there's, there's problem now with a cell phone uh, uh, service at the, where the truck is parked. I don't know is weather related or whatever, but I'm having those um, once again, those Florence flashbacks, but thankfully it all came off and it, it literally the, the power didn't go off and the show did come off. And everybody, and even Hammerstone, we'll talk about it in a second, we'll talk about all the talent, but he was a a fucking trooper. He actually took the last leg of his flying journey to Milwaukee dressed in his ring gimmick because he knew he was letting, he left his checked bag at the airport and just literally ran from the gate to a waiting car and jumped in in his 20 minutes to, to the building. So that was, that was a close one, but... Um, so we get out once again, you know, it's, it's by the time that I've got some of the staff the production crew and everything riding with me, we get out of there at midnight. Uh, then uh, I binge eat, but 24 hours later, I binge eat again at Denny's where they, they actually watched me have the chicken fried steak with gravy, mashed potatoes and, and 
mac and cheese along with the double diner burger and the fries and god damn it their milkshake machine was broken those motherfuckers uh or we would have had that because then i know i'm not eating for another 24 hours because it now by the time you go to bed is three o'clock we're up doing a pre-taped items and and post-production things and announcer things and wild lines and stuff at, at 10 the next day and that continues until almost five o'clock and then i'm thinking do i want to go through chicago again on monday morning or sunday afternoon so as soon as we're finished with this production i hop i throw my shit in the truck and hop in and i drive another two hours past the chicagoland metropolitan area and stop in beautiful what the fuck is that town goddamn uh in in indiana it's it's exit two 253 it's a fine place where they had a wonderful outback and now i haven't eaten in 24 hours again so i had the fucking the wings and the volcano shrimp and they've got a new fried chicken a dish where they take the seasoning that they season the awesome blossom with and they bread the chicken in that and deep fried and then drizzled the blossom sauce over the tie. And I had that with the steakhouse mac and cheese and the smashed taters and four Reese cups for dessert. Cause I hadn't eaten in all that time. And then I promptly shit myself to sleep and got up the next morning and, and came the rest of the way home. And I was in the house about one o'clock and I know how to get in and get out of a motherfucker. I don't waste any time. I don't let any grass grow on me on these road trips. That's the way you, do it. you should do a guide for burger joints where you rate every burger joint you've gone to. Cause every time you talk about going someplace, you talk about getting a hamburger so that people know if they're traveling, where to get a good burger, where to stay away from. You should do something like that. Well, you know who I learned this from on the road. No. Blackjack Lanza. Really? Because Jack Lanza, if, if, and I mean, I was already a burger fanatic. But when you think about it, when you're on the road and you're going to these strange places and you don't know, and it's all over the page, he had a saying. And his, he said his wife used to get mad at him. They would go out to a nice steak restaurant or some high-tone dining establishment he'd order a burger you know why because in his words you can't fuck up a cheeseburger oh yes you can well you can (laughs) but but when you think about it it's the easiest food to make really for any fuck every moron is eating a cheeseburger and kind of sort of knows what it's supposed to look like but he had that attitude he said He'd rather get the moderately priced cheeseburger, which is harder to fuck up than the fucking steak that they ruined or this goddamn highfalutin stuff that he don't even know what's in it. But I always just like those words. You can't fuck up a cheeseburger. But a lot, but, and beer bellies does not. And boy, I tell you what, that was so good. But anyway, the uh, broadcast of uh, MLW's Fury Road, uh, 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 besides the adverse weather conditions and the travel, which was a nightmare and et cetera, uh, I once again had a good time, saw a couple guys that I was not that familiar with. I saw some, the, uh, the, the next gear, as they used to say, when they say, oh, you got to kick it into the next gear. I've seen a couple of these guys kicking it into the next gear. And if you didn't see the live program, uh, it's on YouTube. Type in MLW on YouTube and you could watch it. But I asked Brian for once. Normally, you ask me to watch things. <clears throat> and uh, and I do, like a subservient little puppy. But I actually asked you to watch something. You did. And you did. And it was, uh, we've talked about Brian Pillman Jr. on the program and Alexander Hammerstone, who I've had a lot of praise for. And they had the final match for the national open weight championship, the, the tournament final. And it was, you know, here's an example of what I look for. Was this the greatest television match in the history of television matches? No, but these guys are two guys that have been in the wrestling industry for about two years now. And they have a combination of the athletic ability the look, the youth, the size, the personal charisma. And at this point in time in their careers, they're they're They had a good showing and they're doing well as far as having a match in the ring that while they did know Alexander Hammerstone did no 
880 degree cannonball topes over the top rope but he's the kind of guy you can draw money with because of the way he looks physically because the way he can move at that size because the personality he has and the promos that he cuts I've talked about uh, MJF, who, by the way, once again, I've I've got a chance to watch them shoot some things um, as well as wrestle. But MJF is the best promo in the business. And I get heat all over him. I'm pretty sure every time I praise him like this, but fuck it, you know, haters going to hate as they as the kids say. Uh, He's so fucking good. I wish that I had been as good as he is when I was 22 years old. The only thing I think I'm a, I was ahead of him on when I was 22 is that I obviously was already working for Bill Watts and had had the chance to work for more geniuses for longer than he has in terms of wrestling psychology. But as performer, pro, uh, promo, <clears throat> etc., he's doing great. And Hammerstone has really turned it up also over the past few tapings that I've seen him. As far as a guy that can talk, and he has that fucking attitude. You don't believe he's playing the part of being a wrestler. He is is a pro wrestler, and he's that guy. He is Alexander Hammerstone. And uh, Brian Pillman, who is... Everybody looks at Brian like a second-generation wrestler. But when you think about it, yes, in, in terms of bloodline and name, he is, but unfortunately... He was barely born. I mean, I'm not even sure at, at, at what age exactly he was when his when his dad passed away, but he didn't get to grow up around the boys, going into the locker rooms, et cetera, learning these psychological things as second nature. But he, uh, uh, once again, his match on Saturday night, he was the, the, in the Ricky Morton role, as they say, he was the smaller baby face against a really physically dominant bully heel, but he didn't die. He kept firing up. Uh, one of the better outings that I've seen him have, as far as I don't look for a de- degree of difficulty of 10 and an execution of five. And I always told guys this on tryout camps or seminars or whatever for any company, WWE on down, I look for degree of difficulty of five and execution of 10. If you can do a, a good match flawlessly, that's better than trying to goddamn have the main event at Stark 86 and fucking a quarter of the shit up. Uh, and anyway... I thought they had a good match and I was going before I praise these folks even more. I wanted to have your thoughts on, on Pillman and Hammerstone. Cause for once I ask you what you think about something. This is the first time I've seen Hammerstone. I've seen clips of Pillman jr. Before, but never a complete match. I guess I'll talk about him first. I've been led to believe he wasn't as good as I thought he was in the ring. Considering his lack of experience. I thought he had a good look. I thought his facials are really good. I thought, he seemed like he has a lot of potential. Don't don't be afraid to knock that that Snow White bleach job. That he just got that done. But, I, it, and, but and, he looks like a star. It looks so. <laughs> but he unique. doesn't look like a star. Yeah. But he looked like a star beforehand, but with hair that was toned down a little bit. But I don't want to make Brian feel bad. But but yeah, see, he and, and that's what I was going to say. He's gotten uh, some rap in some places for, uh, like you said, you you thought he was better than you had been led to believe he was. He's had some issue with he's a guy unless you he needs experience to work in the ring with and against uh, and or or someone to help him sort out the the gaga sometimes that he's told he's got a lot to live up to. And, you know, with that last name, and I think he's finally uh, I think he, he focused on that in this match. And it was for live television. This they, these guys they didn't, get, didn't get any second chances and nothing was cleaned up. Uh, you know, I, that's why I thought it was a real good, a real good outing, as they say. Now, Hammerstone, how old is he? You know, I forgot to, I think he's like 20 fucking four or five. Maybe he's been wrestling a couple of years. That's what I was going to say. I didn't look at him and think, oh, this guy's only been working a couple of years. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, he looks like the love child of Louis Spicoli and Larry Heinemey. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, well, if they're ever looking for another Anderson brother, y- you know what? He would fit. Yeah, but uh, I thought I thought it was a good match. I-, I can't really say too much negative about it. I thought it was a good match, and uh, I am now going to be paying attention to both of these guys to see what they do. You know, and and see, that's the thing is is uh, 
I, as a person who has been a talent scout, for lack of a better term, who's booked people place, who's who's uh, run seminars and uh, obviously uh, operated a uh, par- partially owned a professional wrestling academy of some note. I don't want to see guys that uh, that don't look the part trying to look work like Superman or, you know, the guys that are 160 pounds trying to impress everybody with the level of flips they can do. You need to have, if, if the total package wasn't already used, you could use it on a guy like Hammerstone. He's got a bit of everything. Pillman has a bit of everything. Uh, the other guy, the dynasty, I was going to mention Richard Holiday is the other guy in the dynasty with Hammerstone and MJF. And the reason why he's got the other guy spot is because there you got the best Probo. And then you've got the, the, the guy who's so physically impressive. And, but holiday, I got a chance to watch him more this weekend. And he is, he's fucking good himself. He's just overshadowed in that environment. But he can talk. He always he's always dresses the part. He looks good. He's a good worker. He's he's worked because he's another young guy, 22 or three or four or whatever. I mean, they're all I've got socks on right now, older than all these guys. So these are the kind of guys that I get excited about because I've worked with mostly young guys for the past 15 years or more with OVW and Ring of Honor. And uh, but, you know, the the uh, the, the contra unit. We've talked about Jacob Fatu, uh, who is a beast and who was just incredible again this past weekend. Uh, the athleticism for a guy that size, I've seen all of the members of the Samoan family. And I, honest to God, have never been as a fan of one instantly from just seeing them like I am of of Jacob Fatu's because he's got a little bit of everything. But uh, the, Samael is is... It, it's almost, it's what I would have done if you said update the Sheik. Because listen, some of the, the Sheik was the the biggest heel, the biggest box office heel in the history of wrestling. But some of his stuff would be dated now in today's environment. But here you've got this kind of vaguely Middle Eastern, you know, rough looking guy in this expensive suit with the cigar and the jewelry and he had a, a undetermined means of income. Uh, that throws fire and fucking, you know, the global dealers in violence. And then uh, the other guy in that group is Simon Gotch because even though he's the shooter of the bunch, but he is the normal human being. So naturally the other two, the monster and the fucking, the sheik of the 21st century take up most of the attention, but keep an eye on all these guys. And I'm not saying this just because I work for them. But actually, I saw him in person, and I like that. And and uh, and I will one more MLW plug, and we'll move on. Um, the Von Eric boys, Marshall and Ross, debuted Saturday night. It was not on the live program. We taped television also, and the six man was them and Tom Lawler, who is really finding himself, I think, on promos and has been more aggressive uh, against the country unit, and they tore the fucking place down, and literally and figuratively of. Uh, if you're a fan of the old Memphis brawls in the Coliseum on June 22nd, when that match airs, uh, Tom Lawler's quote afterwards, he's fought in the UFC and he's been in real fights, obviously on a personal basis. He said, it's the first time since he's been in wrestling that he thought like he, he felt like he was in a real fight. It was fucking chaos. And they did, uh, quite the, uh, quite the job, all of them. So June 22nd on that one. Did Hammerstone get a bonus considering he was so professional, he got prepared on his flight, left his bag at the airport? That sounds like he should get a bonus. He did. They they got him somebody to take him back and get his bag. That was the bonus? That was the bonus. He won the championship. What more, what more can you expect to, but to win gold in your chosen profession like that? I guess so. By the way, just so you know, the woman's fucking mowing her lawn right now. <laughs> I thought I was going to get away with it. I saw her with a wheelbarrow before and a hose. I said, oh, she must be doing something else. She's mowing, though. And there's no fucking grace in her mow. It's just she's like, just she looks like she's angrily pushing this thing. And I just wanted to bring this up real quick. Well, we will uh, we will uh, excuse you if you have audio problems. Um, I will mention that we will have no problems tonight. 
The weather forecast is good tonight, Thursday, June 6th in Florence, Kentucky, the greater Cincinnati metropolitan area for the Florence Freedom and the Windy City Thunderbolts, the pro wrestling night. Myself, good old JR, Jim Ross, Billy Gunn, Marty Jannetty. Now here, I hear Brian Pillman Jr. is going to be over there. Also the Cincinnati kids. So it's pro wrestling night. If you hear this when it first drops, then you still got time. Florencefreedom.com. We're going to do a Q and a VIP meet and greet, uh, I may throw out the first pitch. I don't know. Depends on how my shoulder feels. You know, I'd hate. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I I love baseball. I played baseball throughout my life. I've never even thought about the idea of you throwing a baseball. Do you actually think? Have you ever thrown a baseball? A and B. Do you think you could actually get it from the pitcher's mound to home plate on a fly? Well, number one, yes, I have thrown a baseball. Um, it's been quite a number of years. Uh, and, and, and even the last few times that I did it, it had been a number of years in between, but I have thrown a baseball and I could, I could get it. I could get it that far. I don't know how close it would be to the plate, but I could get it that far. I can, I can fling, I can fling shit really good. I just can't throw it very straight. I don't know if you could throw a baseball. We all know you could swing a bat. Maybe that's a better way to utilize you. At that, well, at that yeah, show. there you go. And it'd be the first time that I'd swung a bat at an actual baseball. And God, I don't know how long. Anyway, that's if June 6th in Florence, um, July the 6th, coincidentally enough, I will return to the broadcast booth for MLW in Chicago at uh, Cicero Stadium. July 6th for the big television taping. July 12th through the 14th in Knoxville at the Fanboy Expo. I'll be there all three days, folks. The Midnight Express, Eaton Lane, and Condry will be there all day on Saturday the 13th. And then, of course, coming up in August, T-Mart Productions and all those fine folks are presenting The Gathering in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's going to take place the second, I believe, weekend of August. Uh, Obviously, it's on jimcornett.com. Click on events and appearances. And while you're there, the Midnight Express... American Cancer Society signed reunion photos, as I've mentioned, are just are flying right now. And those are limited, by the way, folks. We've got I'm pretty sure we've got less than we got less than 80 of the uh, Eaton and Lane Midnight Express combo of uh, autograph pictures and probably 100 or 110 ish of the reunion pictures. So they'll sell out here at some point. And of course, the hate T-shirts are a hit. But get, we've got such a new audience, Brian. The Cult of Cornette membership certificates are flying out the doors now. And this is an item we've had for a while, but it showed the new listenership. They're just all over the place. The new listeners is what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you're supposed to say, well, as a matter of fact, Jim, last week's program and, it, and crow about how many people listened to the program. Last week, we have a lot to crow about in terms of the number. By the way, across the board, you know, this is now, I think, what, five months in a row where we've destroyed the numbers from the previous month, and it just keeps going up and up, and last month was ridiculous, and last episode, uh, and we're recording it before it's even a full week up, it's just through the roof. I don't know if you want me to give actual numbers or not. Well, so I, 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 no, I just wanted you to pray, because I told you before we went on the air, I said, no matter how mad I make people or how pissed off I make people, basically, if I just, it's the opposite of the Seinfeld episode where George Costanza said he was going to do the exact opposite of whatever his normal inclination would be and and he would be successful. I just have to just basically uh, say whatever the fuck my first inclination is and, and people seem to enjoy that. So I appreciate you guys all for listening. And, uh, and the Cult of Cornet certificate, membership certificates, which by the way, I, I know the older fans remember, are printed on heavy cardstock uh of course the pledge again we pledge allegiance to the leader of the mighty cult of cornet and to the pro wrestling for which he stands no blow-up dolls dick spots or dance routines with blood sellouts and shoot angles for all signed and filled in with your name 10 bucks at jimcornet.com because we all got to stick together That's right. As a matter of fact, before we go into our deep dive into a deep cavernous asshole, why don't you tell the people what you're doing this week? And then I'll, I'll come back with more. Speaking of deep cavernous assholes this week on the Arcadian Vanguard podcast network, another action packed week of the finest in wrestling programming. I want to thank everyone for checking out John Arezzi's pro wrestling spotlight. Then and now we have been overwhelmed by the reaction and 
It only gets better from here. This week on the show, we have audio from Paul Heyman, Bruno San Martino, and what happens when promoter Mark Tenler decides he wants to do his own angles in the studio. You got to hear this train wreck. You can hear it at pwspod.com or wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. We also have a Patreon where each unedited original broadcast will go up, patreon.com slash arezzi. After the show goes up where John and I review the show, you can hear the original broadcast with even all the commercials by going to the Patreon page. Also want to make mention that Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam and Sean Goodwin about to hit their anniversary one year on the air. Check them out for the finest and classic wrestling talk at McAdamPod.com or wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. Of course, you can get information about all Arcadian Vanguard shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A lot of people also ask when the Jim Cornette experience or drive through or any of the videos go up, that's a great place to find it. You go to facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard and those links will be there. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, the mothership. Hee-haw. I don't think you've hit me with that one before. <laughs> I will accept it. It's a Hee Haw edition. Episode 99 is out today. And of course, that is with Scott Teal, Chad Austin, Fredo Esparza on the life of Silver King, Roman Gomez on the card that Marty Funk destroyed, and so much more. (laughs) Episode 100 is in production right now, and this is going to be a big one and a fun one. The top 10 returns, but you can hear this and so much more, including every single episode in the archive at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast, including Spotify, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. All right, we got to go ahead and settle all this stuff once and for all. Uh, last week, once without even meaning to this time, I mean, we like I said earlier, we knew we were going to stir up the all elite wrestling fan. The the uh, uh, I can't even say all elite wrestling fans. The young bucks fans, the P- P- Omega fans, the play wrestler fans, etc. By not just bowing at the altar of you know the new phenomenon that is play wrestling. Although, like we said, what happened? Even though there were parts of the show you put over things that you did like, everyone just focused on the things that you didn't like. Not the things that you did like. Well, yes, but also it, the the ones that I'm going to talk about that are about to be offended are, are are the primarily the play wrestling fans. But uh, it, and and in hindsight, if they had not presented that battle royal as the first taste we got, that's like going to a restaurant and the appetizer has fucking maggots crawling out of it. But that entree was delicious. You know, it soured the whole meal. And and in hindsight, I would have liked the show a lot better probably overall had it not been for that. But that Battle Royal, for a company that said we're going to be sports-based, we're going to be – we're not going to do the goofy backstage stuff or we're, we're going to – wins and losses matter. And and to be serious and try to put a good foot forward and have an outlaw mud show, gimmick-filled, inexplicable. It, it looked like Darwin's waiting room. It was the, – the whole crew came in and Ken Kesey's Merry Pranksters minibus. <laughs> it was a, – a, a, <sighs> And the winner gets a title shot. And the winner gets a title shot against either Chris Jericho or Kenny Omega. So just uh, the legless boy. I'm surprised JoJo the dog face boy was, but now the dog face boy lobby is going to be upset at me. But the point is we were making mockery in my normal inimitable way about how that they really shit the bed on their first match. And it was embarrassing and it was offensive as uh, to a wrestling fan. And to me as a wrestling professional, and in the process of doing that, we described the various parade of horrors that was coming in from the from the legless man to the guy painted yellow to the guy with the hands in his pockets to the idiot lighting a cigarette to the guy staple gun in the cigarette to the guy's head to the fucking guy in the dinosaur mask to the on on and on and on right and and just to to refresh people's memory or if you didn't listen to the program last week. And it, boy, it was listened to. Uh, you've got some clips of just where I was describing the people involved in this in this battle royal filled with gimmicks. Where the the same thing. If you've got twelve seven foot guys, you got no giants. If you have a a ring filled with gimmicks, you have no gimmicks. Play, play those descriptions for me, please. 
the first line I wrote on my notes, there's a guy in here with no legs. Up and apparently it was Dustin Thomas, as we would find out here shortly. He's a double amputee, and he was laying, sitting, perched. I don't know what the fuck you call that position. He's in the ring. He has no legs, and, he, and his upper body is not that fucking huge. And once again, I am not, I'm not knocking this guy. He's got more guts than I do. And it's it, it, horrible that, that he had to have his legs amputated and all respect to him. This is the first thing I see from a new wrestling from, and the announcer is talking about how great this is that everybody gets a chance. If, if this guy's lifelong dream was to play in the NFL would they put him in a fucking game? If it if his if he was the biggest basketball fan in the world, would the NBA let him go out there and pass the ball in a game? If 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 it's not right there, then it's not right here for the business and for this guy. But then Sunny Days is a guy that's painted yellow. Uh, so when we figured that out, then the Michael Nakazawa. A guy gets a waist lock on him and he comes out of his tights with a bottle of baby oil and pours it all over himself and gets slick and slips out of the hold. And then Jimmy Havoc and Joey Janela, there's a pair. And then somehow Janela is sitting in the ring. This is that fucking idiot that just does stupid shit for attention. Marco Stunt. The fucking little kid that broke his leg is back already, and they're letting him wrestle again. He's going to get fucking killed. And this guy, now that I've seen him for more than a couple of second clip, can't be five feet tall and can't be 100 pounds. It's fucking embarrassing. Then here comes Sonny Kiss, who apparently got off his day job at the drag show at the fucking Tropicana. And I, I don't know, but see, they're not explaining any of this. Marco Stunt, why is this small child competing in this match with the legless guy and the 400-pound man and all this other, for the guy with the the dinosaur mask and then then with the, the, the transvestite or exotico, as they would say at AAA, did anybody bother to explain why he looks like that? No, they just accepted that here's another member of our roster, no reason to... And nothing to look at here, folks. Suddenly, Paige and Janela get in the middle and they have a bad hockey fight because Janela physically looks like shit. He's one of these fucking guys. I mean, he's pale, fishy white, fucking no tone, no fucking definition, lumpy. The announcers, the one that's scared to death and the one that's obviously a fucking clown because he's got a mask on and calls himself Excalibur. Some clown named Orange Cassidy gets in. I didn't even see where he came into this fucking thing, right? He just appeared somehow. Hey, I don't think he was announced. But they said his name's Orange Cassidy when he gets in the ring. He's wearing blue jeans and no shirt. He he might weigh 150 pounds, fishy white. He looks like one of these fucking skateboard fucks that you see on these stupid videos on ridiculousness, right? Fuck everybody that had anything to do with putting that fucking thing together or executing it because you all set wrestling back 50 fucking years. Well, there it is, Jim, a collection of your thoughts about the battle Royal. Well, and, and obviously that was trimmed for time because they're there, you know, but that was the flavor of it. The point to the whole thing was it was a parade of nonsense. It was gimmick after gimmick after gimmick. And my problem with the entire fiasco was that it was silly, phony, goofy wrestling from a brand new big budget company <clears throat> that it would behoove them to be taken seriously. And I obviously expected that the wrestlers that I criticized probably wouldn't like it. And, and usually they get mad because that's what wrestlers do is they get mad. I get mad. Everybody gets mad. I didn't realize I was actually legitimately going to hurt anybody's feelings. But that's apparently what happened. Because, of course, the show goes up on Thursday. Friday morning, as we talked about, I leave for Milwaukee. And I'm in the car for 10 hours, so I have no idea what's going on in the world. 
And when I get to the hotel and I get there and I get unpacked, I get settled down, got the air cranked up and everything, <clears throat> I get on Twitter and there is just a sh just a, a, a plethora, just countless thousands of tweets pro me and con me and this me and that me. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm trying to gather what the fuck has gone on here, right? Apparently, Sonny Kiss, who was the exotico in question, I don't even know what term to use now. Um, his boyfriend on Twitter tweeted that they were upset or that they were dismayed with me or whatever because how they took whatever I said to, to not be this a critique of the entire battle royal and all the clown showness of the whole thing. <clears throat> but specifically, Sonny Kiss, and it was ha homophobic and transphobic. And so, and, and apparently that's what he tweeted, which wouldn't have been a big deal except more on this later. But uh, th now I'm starting to read all these people go, well, why should he have to explain himself and justify himself? Can't he just be himself? That was not the point of the entire fucking exercise, ladies and gentlemen, because the people who listened to the show understood what we were talking about and the people who didn't and got stirred up on Twitter, more on that later, didn't get the whole fucking deal. It wasn't that he has to explain himself for being gay. It's that he ne somebody, the announcers, somehow needed to explain any of the various and sundry, wacky, far out, flamboyant, or otherwise odd gimmicks that were populating the Battle Royal because it looked like a fucking fiasco. <laughs> and nobody was talking about his sexuality or lack thereof, except it, 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 if, first of all, I, I'm, I'm now told that sometimes it could be insulting if you refer to it as a drag show. Now, my wife is from Cal San Francisco, California. She ev Almost every friend she has is gay. She has talked about going to drag shows, so I assume this was a thing. But it, it, uh, uh, I don't know now. See, we don't know for sure. <clears throat> and as far as uh, transvestite, I've I've been told now that that's unsavory or somehow insulting. I have the American Heritage Dictionary right here in my hand, which says transvestite, a person who dresses and acts in a style or manner of the opposite sex. What's a boy to do? But, so it, it, it suddenly this has become now that I'm mad at Sonny Kiss because he's gay, or I don't even know whether he was gay or not until, the, until then, but because he's gay or or whatever, instead of because he was engaged in a silly, phony, stupid wrestling match. So <clears throat> I do want to say to Sonny Kiss and his boyfriend, who I'm not acquainted with either, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. But if you're going to be in a wrestling business, just like if you're going to be in sports or entertainment or politics or any kind of television or public life, People are going to say a lot worse thing. Let me go back. Did you clip the entirety of everything that I said about Sonny Kiss? I did. I mean, it's not that much. It was just a few lines, but I have. Well, go ahead and play just every every reference I made to Sonny Kiss in last week's program. All right. Here's the first one. We heard parts of this already in the uh, overall clips, but th this is the isolated version. Then here comes Sonny Kiss, who apparently got off his day job at the drag show at the fucking Tropicana. And I, I don't know, but see, they're not explaining any of this. Marco Stunt, why is this small child competing in this match with the legless guy and the 400-pound man and all this other friend, the guy with the the dinosaur mask, and then then with the, the, the transvestite or exotico, as they would say at AAA, did anybody bother to explain why he looks like that? No, they just accepted that here's another member of our roster. No reason to, nothing to look at here, folks. That was the first clip. There was a second clip that we did not play earlier that you, where you talked about Sunny Kiss. And here's well, yeah, because here's, and let me, wait a minute. Let me just say, here's the one spot. Now I managed Adrian Street. 
And part of his gimmick was that he would, as he referred to it in his in his wonderful accent, touch the referee up the ass every in 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 the match. But he was also wrestling seriously and and fucking competing, etc. If Sonny Kiss had a single match and the one gimmick spot that he did was ramming the guy's face into his ass, but he also wrestled, then that's working his gimmick. But when you once again have an entire match of comedy spots with the guy with slow motion shin kicks and just people being stupid and acting silly, and then that's the one highlight spot you get is a silly spot, you're going to get criticized for it. Here's the clip. Uh, so anyway, then Tommy Dreamer is in with Sonny Kiss. Sonny Kiss did the old, imagine an upside down Bobo Brazil, where Bobo used to get in the turnbuckle and lift his legs and put him on the guy's shoulders and head scissor him that way. Sonny Kiss was upside down doing a push up on the top turnbuckle with the guy's legs or his legs around the guy's, around Dreamer's neck. And he starts bringing his legs in and running Tommy Dreamer's face into his fucking ass. And Tommy's going, and Tommy Dreamer is like Mick Foley. He is way too fucking nice. And he wants to help these fucking guys get over, even when he is helping guys that have in no way deserved to get over or have a prayer of getting over, get over with this bullshit. And there's clip two, Jim. And that's pretty much uh, the sum total of Sonny Kiss references in the program. <clears throat> and once again, <laughs> if, if if there's 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 nothing wrong with comedy spots in a wrestling match. There's the cheetah segment in the Tarzan movie. It's the comedy relief or whatever. But that whole thing was a series of comedy relief. Only we didn't get much relief from it. So, and that's what I was criticizing. And for the people who have cognitive thought and understand context and things and who actually listen to the program, hopefully that's shown through. Uh, if, I've, if I've hurt Sonny's feelings or any of his uh, family or friends or whatever, fans, whatever, by using the term transvestite, which I thought since is an addiction, you know, fuck's not in the dictionary. So I thought they left the dirty words out. Or insinuating that he might have work at the drag show, then I, I do feel bad about that. But here's also the thing. If I do go to the drag show, whether the Tropicana has one these days or wh wherever it may be located, <clears throat> and in the chorus line, out comes a guy dressed like a wrestler in boots and tights and a ring jacket. Am I not allowed some fucking explanation there too? I paid good money for that ticket to that drag show. Why is this guy dressed like a wrestler in the middle of my drag show? It's all context. And nobody was explaining any of this. It just all, if you're, <clears throat> here's another thing. If you're going to have a flamboyant gimmick, there's a guy on the NWA 70th anniversary show named Mike Perro. And uh, since I was doing the color commentary, obviously I had wrestler bios and, and uh, you know, uh, notes on the talent. And one of the notes on him was, that he's an openly gay athlete who devotes some of his time to LGBTQ causes. <clears throat> so we, we mentioned that along with, I think he was in the service. He did something else out of what the fuck. And he went out, he was dressed in wrestling attire and he went out and had a wrestling match. So there was no need to beat it to death one way or the other. But if you're going to have a flamboyant gimmick, whether it's based on your real life or not, you're going to have to expect people to comment on it. But that wasn't really the cause of all the goddamn stir. The, the <clears throat> you know, the, there was a limited amount of uh, followers that was following Sonny's boyfriend's comments, but then it got retweeted. And you know who retweeted it, don't you, Brad? The, the arbiter of sexual mores in America today, ladies and gentlemen, the guy who gets paid and sometimes pays people to grab his dick and throw them around by it, the guy who pays women to vomit on his penis in front of the public in a, the middle of what he claims to be wrestling matches, which are poor 
imitations of professional wrestling perpetrated by him and a cast of clowns who stick blow pops up each other's asses and then suckle on them, much like a dirty dingo's penis in the Australian outback. A guy who makes up his dick as an Easter basket for children and tweets pictures of it. A guy who tweets rape jokes and jokes about, what was it, Brian? Woody? He was going to have sex with a pregnant woman so he could have a threesome. Well, he retweeted someone else said that. Someone else tweeted that. It may or may not have been song lyrics from what I've heard, but the point was he retweeted it. it which is, you know, retweets are endorsements. But anyway, Joey Ryan, the dick guy, retweets uh, 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 Sonny's boyfriend being having hurt feelings at me and says this homophobic transphobic rant by Jim Cor how dare this garbage human being be allowed to exist and blah 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 and be employed by and 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 he tagged the, the, that's what the kids say right tagged it tagged MLW and BN Sports and and basically all the various and sundry people that I work for because I'm on every TV network and fucking major podcasting system in the world. And he's in a bar in California getting puked on. So <laughs> he's upset is what he is. And he retweets this. And I know what Joey Ryan was thinking. Joey Ryan was thinking back to the time where I fired him from ring of honor because Carrie said they were soaking Carrie Silken for money flying this idiot from the West coast and paying him hundreds of dollars a night to do something a $50 job guy could do. And he's upset because I've every time that he does something else embarrassing, that is a joke to wrestling and is without any form of talent whatsoever, just a fucking shock thing. He just vomits in the street for attention because he's a fucking puke and a, a frustrated preliminary wrestler. You know what a preliminary wrestler is, don't you, Brian? Yes. That's a wrestler that's in preliminary matches. Nobody pays to see them. They're just interchangeable. <clears throat> and that's what Joey Ryan was until he figured out a way to get people to talk about him by doing the stupidest shit in public possible because he has no shame. So what he did was he tried to be a little narc. He tried to be a little stooge. And he said, you know, he said to himself, I'll tell you exactly what Joey Ryan said to himself. He said to himself, you know, all the play wrestling fans that follow me around that are entertained by the stupid shit that I do and that my jack off friends do because we're completely all unprofessional. We all like to do this horse shit. And these idiots that are entertained by this, they'll believe anything that I say. They won't bother to check it out. They don't listen to Jim Cornette because, you know, all those big words and everything. And that's what he said to himself. He said, Lance, I'll tell you, I mean, Brian <laughs> or Lance Russell, I'll tell you exactly what he said, Lance. He said, I'll just stir all these play wrestling fans up. I'll just stir all these play wrestling fans up because now also he, he sucks up to the different categories on the internet now, because anything related to the genital genitals, he apparently has a copyright on because, you know, when you think about big dicks, you think about Joey Ryan, but anything related to the genitals or sex, because, you know, he's sponsored by the porn company. So now he's become a champion of gay rights. He's become a champion of gay rights whenever he thinks he can get heat on me with a bunch of people that didn't hear what I said and ain't going to take the time to listen. That's when he's champion. He's a phony. He's as phony as a get well card from an undertaker. He's as phony as a football bat. He sucks up to these different groups of people because that's his little subgenre, his little subculture. It's the only way that he can make money on the fringes, on the perverted periphery of the wrestling business, is by sucking up to people even though he's a phony and he doesn't mean any of it, and existing on this in this subculture of underground bar shows and dive bar fiascos that he calls wrestling. <laughs> and he was jealous of me because he's in a, I'm in a place that he'd like to be, but he knows he ain't going to be working at MLW, especially not now, long as I'm around, which apparently is going to be a while because the, the, uh, all the people that he tagged in, in uh, that little tweet of his 
they had the same reaction of, well, first of all, they had to react, who the fuck is Joey Ryan? And then they all of a sudden, another disgruntled outlaw wrestler because everybody else listened to the program and they know that there wasn't anything homophobic or transphobic said. The only thing I was phobic about was stupid, silly wrestling. And that's what got to Joey Ryan. That's what got to Joey Ryan in the pit of his stomach. Because in the pit of his stomach, down deep in the back of his little twisted, perverted mind in his brain, he realizes that I'm right about what he is, that he's a no-talent piece of shit, that he he's just slime in the sewer of the subculture of wrestling. He know and and that burns at him. It burns down deep in his stomach. And no amount of Prilosec is going to clear that up. It burns down deep in his stomach that he can't be any good in the wrestling business, and he'll never get on big-time TV because the only thing he's got to offer can't be played in front of decent folks. So Joey Ryan is the one who stirred all this shit up. But I didn't go on any homophobic or transphobic rants, and the only people that believe that are the people that listen to a fucking goof like Joey Ryan. So, Joey, I hope you got some more Twitter followers this week and hope you got some more people to talk about you and your magic dong because you were rubbing elbows with a real star in wrestling like Jim Cornette. So I hope that uh, <clears throat> that you uh, you got what you wanted, but I just I use your name instead of dick boy like I usually call you because when I call somebody as strong a piece of shit as I'm calling you, I want to I want to use their name so there's no mistake, son. So to Sonny Kiss, if I hurt your feelings, I apologize, but I think you need to get a thicker skin. I think that uh, everybody else that follows Joey Ryan and don't bother to listen to what I say can, well, I guess this is probably the wrong time to say below me, so I'll just say <laughs> you can fuck right on off because I drink your tears, you play wrestler fans, you Omega and Young Bucks and Wrestling's supposed to be fun and silly, and and we're all supposed to have fun with playing and wrestling. I drink your fucking tears, and they energize me like Ultraman's fucking super energy power pack, motherfuckers. I could give a fuck whether you like me or not. And to Joey Ryan, once again, I hate to toot my own horn, but toot toot, I'm still a bigger star than you are, Joey Ryan, and that you'll ever be. And in your dreams... If you ever dream, if you ever have a glorious Technicolor dream that you mean half as much as Jim Cornette in the wrestling business, then, son, you better wake up and apologize because you have offended the dream gods. <sighs> it's amazing someone whose career is built around his dick could be such a cunt. Could be. <laughs> and I got to say, just real quick, because I've got gay family members. I have people I'm really good friends with who are gay and trans, and I think you do a real disservice to them when you label people who were not homophobic homophobic and transphobic the it's week like, before you defended gay marriage on the show the yeah, week yeah. before <laughs> the episode but again the people yeah. who complain the most him and priscilla the tampon girl just happened to oh, be the I people. i forgot about the tampon skank yeah that that one but well, she's in on it but they just happen to be the people who you've openly talked about the disgust you have for the style of work or whatever they think their art is it's all bullshit. It's all crap. It's would, desperation would, is what it is. Wouldn't you know who won the pony is what you're saying. No, I, I, well, I, exactly. And, and also <laughs> the fucking thing is there were clearly a bunch of members of the gay community or trans community. I now don't even know what terminology to use, but of the, of the, the community on Twitter saying, what are you people talking about? Are you delusional? There was no insult, but however, I got one letter and I'll leave it at that. I think this summed it up best uh, from Colin. Hi, Jim. I've been closely following the storm that has developed on Twitter regarding your review of AEW's double or nothing pay-per-view and in particular, the controversy over certain remarks about Sonny Kiss. People will interpret your words as they see fit. What matters is the intent of the statement. And in that regard, I firmly believe that your hands are clean you may want to brush up on your terminologies, though, smiley face. <clears throat> this brings me to the reason for my letter. I sincerely don't believe that your words contained even the slightest homophobic intent, yet I've frequently seen the word homophobic being associated with your name in the wake of last week's show. 
It's annoyed me to the point where I feel I want to say something directly to you. I want to say thank you. I want to thank you for the vocal support of the LGBT community that you have expressed on your show. You stand up for our rights on a regular basis, and not only that, you make it a little bit easier for a person like me to be a wrestling fan. Uh, he goes on to say he's been a diehard fan his entire life. Uh, yeah, he's in Ireland. <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. But anyway, over the years, however, I came to understand that despite my love for this wonderful sport, I could never connect with those who appreciated it as I do due to the frequent homophobia experienced by myself and my partner at wrestling events, meetups, and forums. I won't go into the gory details, but suffice it to say that I've had many more negative experiences than positive ones when it comes to trying to connect with wrestling fans, and it's usually because of my sexuality. Whether it be verbal or physical abuse or being present when a large crowd uses a homophobic slur en masse to voice their disapproval at a particular wrestler. After a particularly nasty incident, I decided that I couldn't stand it anymore and cut all ties to the wrestling community. I watched but never engaged, and it really upset me as I'd lost something special. Until I started listening to your podcast. Your open-minded and liberal views made me question the prejudices that had developed in me towards the toxic masculinity within the wrestling community. You boldly stand against religious hypocrisies. You call out unjust and corrupt politicians. You champion the rights of women. And most poignantly for me, you believe that members of the LGBT community should be free of persecution and should be allowed to live our lives as we see fit. As a straight person, you may not understand how much support like that means to us. It means everything. I applaud you, Jim Cornette. Not only for being a decent human being, but for making me second-guess myself and seek out more people like you within the wrestling community. And I've found them. I'm not afraid to be a wrestling fan again, and that is thanks to you. It would break my heart to see you sour on our community based on recent occurrences. You are an ally who is greatly appreciated. And I think just like the comments I made before you read that letter, that letter kind of backs up what I'm feeling and what, again, it's something that means something to me. I have friends, I have family who are gay, who are trans, and I don't take it lightly when you hear someone's homophobic or transphobic for those reasons, and there's none of that. And again, you also look at the intent and you listen to more than one show. It's just, it's so ridiculous. It comes down to, you use terminology, which I must admit, I didn't realize. I, I, I don't think drag is bad. I think maybe just applied the sunny kiss it is because maybe he's, again, I don't know everything about this. I, I take it that he's not a drag performer. That's not the way he sees himself. I know people who are drag performers and that's not a big deal to them. So the term is okay, I guess, when applied properly. And I guess, and I know it was ignorance from you and I don't mean the ignorance in a bad way, but you just didn't know that's not the term you use. Well, there. you know what they say, ignorance is no excuse for the law. And transvestite, same thing. You managed a guy who happened to call himself a transvestite, but he was a straight man. So it wasn't. Well, and, and also here's the thing, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, for fuck's sake. Which of, of, of a number of my significant others in my lifetime have been huge fans of. So I've seen a million times. And, and, I, I, and actually, Adrian had a, a single, Sweet Transvestite with a Broken Nose. That's right. Yes. <clears throat> and Adrian was the most non-homophobic person in the world. Even though he was not gay, he uh, was certainly tolerant of, of all things because it was fucking Adrian. And and they were cool. But anyway, the point is, people, I was not criticizing. And all the list, and you know, here's the thing. I'm preaching to the choir, as they say. Uh, I hate to use reference like that on this program, but everybody who listens to the show knows exactly what's going on, and nobody that listens to the show is going to listen to this or retain it if they do. Uh, that that are that that don't normally follow us, and the, that are fans of the play wrestlers, and this moron can can gin up all this false outrage from people who didn't hear anything, or if they did hear it, they were already preconditioned to hear what they wanted to hear. So I don't even know why I'm, you know. Uh, otherwise, then it's just it's amazing. It, it's not just politics. There are, there are two sides of the uh, of people. In this country, the people who hear, see, and understand what the fuck is going on around them, and people who don't. Guess which side we're on, Brian? Ridiculous. But anyway, and by the way, the 
it, 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 it's like the Jesse Smollett thing. That's what I was going to say earlier also when you said it makes it worse for when people drum up shit like this where there obviously wasn't anything there. It's like the Jesse Smollett thing. People who, who fake shit like that for publicity or neediness or whatever the fuck, then there's a lot of people that are wanting to say, oh, that's all bullshit, and that gives them a reason to. And it, it, it's... And to be quite honest, if Joey Ryan is going to be representing this segment of the population, no wonder that some people might dismiss legitimate issues that confront the gay community when one of its public supporters is a phony wrestler with a magic dong. There's that. Who makes rape jokes on Twitter? Who makes jokes about being a pedophile on Twitter? I have daughters, you nasty motherfucker. That's offensive. Making jokes about rape, that's offensive. Anyway, um, so yeah, so Rocky Horror Picture Show, bad now, um, got to put down the American Heritage Dictionary third edition because that's just, that's just out of touch. And, uh, and I got to stop knocking, you know, I, I just, I didn't ever think I'd hurt a professional wrestler's feelings. I've had death, legitimate death threats delivered to me and I've got them framed and hanging on the wall. I ran with a different crowd. The, the, the boys get their feeling. This used to be a business where if guys got mad at each other, they'd hit each other over the head with tire tools and cut each other with razor blades. And now they get their feelings hurt on Twitter when you talk about their gimmick and say they were at a shitty match. I don't know what to say, my boy. Otherwise, then, then uh, uh, the only thing that offends me, I don't care who you're in love with, who you have relations with, what... A religion you are, a race you are, where your birthplace is, what color you are, what subsection of humanity you may be. Don't have silly, phony, fucking comedy wrestling matches. And I bet you will get along fine. And that's it. So I think next week we're going to do some more good shit that will piss somebody off. But until then, the last thing that I would want to do on this program is piss anybody else off.